Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, a paracord wrapped utility knife. Or hunting knife or tactical knife, you know, whatever's gonna impress your friends the most, call it that. Now, I'm calling it a Saturday project, meaning that if everything goes well, you can start it around, you know, eight or nine in the morning, take a break to watch a little football, cut the grass, have lunch, whatever, and then finish up the blade by early evening. Now, that's pretty cool, but something else that's even cooler. I've been trying to focus on beginning knife makers lately, so we're gonna show how to make one extremely simple knife, but we're gonna use two methods. Pro methods on one hand and beginner methods on the other sort of a choose your poison type thing. So here's the cool thing. If you do everything right, both methods will make an equally good knife. Let me say that again. You can use very simple tools, low tech stuff, labor intensive methods to make a knife that will result in a blade that's absolutely as good as ones that the pros make. Theirs just takes a lot less time. All right, let's launch into it. The knife we're making will be a cord wrapped blade, meaning that its handle is made by wrapping the blade with paracord. Super simple. No complicated or expensive materials. No super steel, no fossilized mastodon ivory handle scales, no 6AL4V titanium. The point I'm hoping to make in this video is that you don't have to have complicated or expensive tools or rare and obscure materials to make a good knife. Will you save time if you have professional tools? Absolutely. But you don't have to sacrifice quality if you haven't mortgaged your house to buy tools. So let's launch into it. First, steel. All steel, guys, is not created equal. These two pieces look the same, but they're not the same. This steel is mild steel, low carbon, suitable for welding, but not for a tool that needs to hold an edge. This, on the other hand, is 1095, a simple high carbon steel that makes an excellent knife. You can buy 1095 online from knife making supply stores like Texas Knife Maker Supply, K&G, Jantz, USA Knife Makers, there are a whole bunch of them, as well as steel suppliers like Admiral Steel and New Jersey Steel Baron. Google it, buy it, ship it, it's at your door in three days. One inch wide, one eighth of an inch thick. That's the stock you want. This blade will be about nine and a half inches long or around 25 centimeters. Mark it off and cut it with a garden variety hacksaw. The pros will cut it with an abrasive chop saw or a band saw saving about 30 seconds of work. Is that a big deal? Not really. See? Done. Okay, here's one of the biggest annoyances in knife making. Steel comes from the mill covered with something called mill scale, an oxide formed when hot steel meets air. It's extremely hard stuff, harder than steel itself, which means that you want to clean it off before doing anything else, otherwise it'll dull your tools. Now, if you're a pro, you can use a belt grinder, a surface grinder, an abrasive tumbler. There are any number of tool intensive approaches. But if you're a beginner, you probably won't have that giant expensive surface grinder hiding in the back of your shop. Fine. Go raid your kitchen for vinegar and a Tupperware pan. Okay. I said you could start at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Well, actually, you needed to do this part ahead of time. Pour in the vinegar, let it sit overnight, or maybe even for a couple days. Then use a $5 welder's brush to get rid of all this scale. It takes a little elbow grease, but it's no big deal. Me, I'm grinding the scale off on my belt grinder. 
Now, removing the scale is not exactly the same as flattening the steel. Depending on what level of finish you're aiming for, you may want to go ahead and flatten the steel too. If you remove the scale through grinding, you've also flattened it more or less. If not, you can use sandpaper. Just tape 80 grit, 120 grit sandpaper, something fairly coarse, to a piece of glass. Now in this case I'm using a machinist's block, but the principle is exactly the same. Now apply elbow grease and just sand away back and forth, back and forth until you've removed all the dimples or tool marks in the steel. Nice and flat. You should be able to do this in about 20 minutes or so. So I've drawn the general shape of the blade. Let me talk about this design. This is not necessarily the ideal shape for a blade. I'm just trying to make something very simple that we can execute on a one inch wide piece of steel. If I were making a more subtle and sophisticated blade, I'd probably have some finger grooves and a guard and maybe a choil and some other refinements, but subtle and sophisticated this blade is not. We're just aiming for dead simple. Now we're going to drill a hole right here. You can do this with a hand drill or even an old fashioned brace and bit. Punch it first so your drill won't walk the hole off center. Then go to it. Or you can do it like I do, stick it in your sweet little curt vise and drill it out on the mill. The result will be fine either way. 3 8 of an inch hole, but that size is not critical. You could go half an inch, 10 millimeters, whatever. It's your knife. Make it however you want. The pros will now go to their belt grinder and grind out that shape. Or, if they're in the more production-oriented world, maybe they've already cut it out on a water jet or a CNC mill or blanked it out with a giant press. But, fear not, you can do this whole thing with a standard double-cut bastard file cost 10 bucks or so at the hardware store. Grinding it on a belt grinder will take four or five minutes. Doing it with a file, okay, I'm not gonna lie to you, it'll take a while. And you'll get tired and cranky and possibly throw your file at your dog. But if you start early, you can still have this part done by 10 o'clock in the morning, swear to God. You'll be amazed how much steel a bastard file can remove if you really put your back into it. Okay, now we have the general shape. Next we get to the fun part, the part that changes this from a chunk of steel into something that looks like a real knife. This step is called beveling because we're creating a slope or bevel on the blade. First, I'm going to score a reference mark down the edge so that I'll know where the center of the blade is supposed to be. This will allow me to grind my bevels nice and even from one end to the other and from side to side of the blade. That's important not only because it looks better, but because it's less likely to warp during heat treating. I can use this nifty little adjustable tool that I made myself, or what about this? Put a screw down on your little piece of glass that you used for sanding earlier and scrub it back and forth like this. Simple. The result is the same nice even guidelines. Now I'm going to use a bastard file again. Honestly, this will be hard work. Filing, 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 filing to create a bevel that sweeps down from the spine to the edge. Now you can make it a shorter saber grind or a longer flat grind that runs all the way to the spine. Your call. Do it however you want. You can also give it a little refinement if you want, cutting in a nice soft plunge line with a round file. Now, I could do all this work right here on camera and show you that it's possible. But trust me, I've filed plenty of knives entirely to shape. Decades ago when I started out, I made quite a few knives this way. It's hard work. Been there, done that. But it is doable, believe me. See my machete video just as an example. Now an alternative filing method, this is called draw filing. It's slower, but it allows for a slightly more accurate bevel angle. 
I don't want to rub this in, but while you're filing five pounds off your waistline, I'm using my Bader B3 belt grinder to grind in the bevels. Your time, maybe an hour or two, mine, closer to 10 minutes. But the result is not significantly better using one method over the other. Remember, the guys who made swords for the Vikings, the Merovingian kings, the emperors of Japan, the sultans of Egypt, those guys did it all with files and scrapers. Crappier files than the one you buy at Home Depot, by the way. And the results are sitting there in museums to this day, outstanding examples of human ingenuity and craftsmanship and beauty. So don't think it can't be done in your garage. Next, I'm going to file a small indentation into each side of the blade. We'll see the point of this later. I'm using a little round hobby file, but a quarter inch chainsaw file would actually be even better. Or we can go the pro route and mill it out. Doesn't have to be too deep, maybe a little over a sixteenth of an inch. So now you've got a knife shaped object. It's still not quite a knife. The step that makes that final transformation is what's known as heat treating. Soft metal becomes hardened steel in an instant. Now, I've been showing multiple methods, but in this case, I'm only showing one. Why? Well, honestly, because setting up a charcoal fire in my backyard was a pain in the ass. But trust me, if you buy traditional hardwood charcoal, attach a piece of black iron pipe to your wife's blow dryer, and then blow air into a charcoal fire, you can produce temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit enough to burn a hole straight through your charcoal grill. And that's far more heat than you need for this project. I've demonstrated how to heat treat with charcoal in other videos, but the basic idea is pretty simple. You just pile it up and blow some air into it, and it'll get hot enough to do what you need to do. So, what do you need to do? Here's what we're aiming for. You're gonna use a heat source. Like I say, it could be a lot of things. It could be an acetylene torch, a propane torch, charcoal like I just talked about, coal, any number of other ways of producing a hot fire to heat your blade up to about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Once it's been fully heated, you're going to plunge it into oil. That simple. In this case, I'll use my propane forge. When steel reaches roughly 1425 degrees Fahrenheit, it stops attracting magnets. So I'm using a little magnet on a stick to test the magnetic qualities of the steel. When I feel that my magnet no longer sticks to the blade, I know that I'm close to my final temperature, which is going to be, as I said, around 1500 degrees. So that's just a little bit beyond that non-magnetic point. I'll heat it just a little more, paying attention to make sure that I have a nice, even red color to my steel. I don't want hot spots. The tip especially can get overheated if you aren't careful. Then I'll quench it in this bucket of peanut oil. Of course, there are specialized quenching oils, but almost any oil will do, from motor oil to transmission fluid to various vegetable oils. Personally, I like peanut oil because it's non-toxic and because it has a relatively high flash point. Once I've quenched the blade, it should now be converted from perlite and ferrite to martensite. That's metallurgy speak for saying it's hard. Just to make sure, I test it with a file. If the file skates over the steel, it's properly converted. If it sort of bites into the steel, then you did something wrong. It hasn't hardened. Now, due to the fact that 1095 is on the margin of hardenability in oil, you may end up with a differentially hardened blade, meaning that it's hard on the edge and softer on the spine. That's okay. There are actually some benefits to that. If you use 1084, on the other hand, it'll probably convert all the way. I won't get into the metallurgy of why that's the case. Anyway, as soon as the blade is cool enough to touch, we'll temper it, meaning we'll soften it up a little. If you don't temper the blade after hardening, it'll shatter like glass when you smack it on something. So I'm putting it into my heat treating oven at 450 Fahrenheit. You don't have to have a professional heat treating oven though. You can just put it in the oven of your kitchen and it'll work just fine. We'll leave it there for an hour, take it out, and let it sit until it's nice and cool. Then I'll put it back in for another hour 
at 450 degrees again. If you really hustled, you could have the blade tempering by early afternoon. So while the blade's sitting there, you can take a break, eat lunch, maybe cut the grass, better yet, switch on the idiot box and watch Clemson stomp the snot out of some weak-ass ACC team. Or maybe you're an SEC fan. I hear Alabama has a football team, too. All right, here's the blade after tempering. All that's left is to clean this black crud off the outside, wrap the handle, and sharpen it. Now, black crud is no match for sandpaper. Do the same thing you did before and clean it all off using the sandpaper on glass trick. You'll also need to clean up the bevels. This area called the plunge line sometimes takes a little extra effort. Wrap some sandpaper around a popsicle stick and you can get that all cleaned up. If you want to, you can run the sandpaper on up to say 600 grit. Or you can finish up with scotch bright. In either case, this will give you a nice satin finish. I've done variants of this in a variety of other videos, so you can check it out in more detail elsewhere if you want. Of course, you can also take the pro route and tumble it or grind it or use a sandblaster. I'm going with the blaster using 60 grit aluminum oxide blast medium. If I wanted, I could follow that up with bead blasting for a more matte finish. In this case, I'm not going to bother though. So whether you did it by hand or with the machine, you should now have a nice clean blade ready for the cord wrap process. Okay, there are over 8 billion YouTube videos about how to paracord wrap a handle, so feel free to choose another method. You can wrap it all in one direction and then loop it and whatever, whatever, or you can crisscross or you can pull the guts out of your paracord and do a fake samurai wrap. Like I say, a million ways of doing this. But what we're going to do here is what's generally referred to as the strider knife approach. We'll start with gutted paracord, meaning we pull out the core. Then we wrap it like so. Super simple, train monkey, train monkey, heat the end, kind of goo it together, and now we have an under wrap. Now comes the more complex part. First, a preliminary word. This is easier if you secure the blade nice and tightly. And it's still easier if you can secure it and then flip it back and forth without taking it in and out of your vise. So you can do this by making a little fixture that fits in your vise. This will take extra time and extra effort, which will not fit in the space between the end of the Clemson game and the time you want to start drinking beer. So I'll show that in another video. Hence, you'll get the simplistic version here, but it still works. Okay, remember those little divots you filed on the blade? Here's why you did it. You don't want the cord wrap sliding up onto the blade, slicing the wrap and possibly your fingers. So you'll put the first loop into those two little indentations and pull it taut. It should stay there until kingdom come. So this wrapping approach is really pretty conceptually simple. The only difficulties with it are keeping the wrap nice and even as it runs down the blade and keeping it taut as you go. Anyway, here's how it works. You make a loop on one side, then you slip the other piece of paracord through and pull it taut. So basically you just have two loops. Then you want to take it out of the vise, flip it over, back in the vise, and then repeat this exactly the same way again on the other side. So you just go flipping back and forth, back and forth, all the way down the knife. Key thing, you want to repeat it exactly the same way every time. If you don't, you won't really have a pattern. It'll just be this big mess. So just make sure that you make those loops exactly the same way each time. Even though it'll work fine, your cousin Kenny will make fun of you and tell you how crappy it looks. And we can't have that. Kenny cannot be allowed to make fun of you under any circumstances because Kenny is... You know, Kenny. So we keep everything nice and tight, nice and perfect. Back and forth, back and forth with the loop exactly in the middle of the blade. We're using a welder's clamp to hold on to it. That helps you keep that tautness all the way down. 
Once you get to the end, loop the paracord several times through the hole until you can't jam it through anymore. Then you make a simple knot like this. The only tricky thing here is that you don't want to pull that knot too tightly right from the get-go. You want to carefully snug it up as tightly as possible to the knife. If you don't, that wrap will come loose. Then another knot out here, and you've got a lanyard. Sharpen up the blade, and you're done. You can do this on an Arkansas stone or a diamond stone, which will take you well into beer drinking hour. Or you can use a belt grinder like the pros do, and then just tune up the edge on a stone or some sort of hone. Either way, you sharpen it until you can shave hair off your arm. Or better yet, off Cousin Kenny's arm. And there you are, ready for SHTF day or the zombie apocalypse or the Michigan State game, whichever one comes first. Final note, bear in mind, this is a steel that rusts over time, so you need to keep it oiled. In a perfect world, you might want to give this knife a finish before wrapping it. Cerakote, Duracote, Molly resin, something like that. Again, we couldn't get that all done on a Saturday afternoon, though. So, that's for another video. By the way, I'll be doing some videos on coatings for steel soon, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, here are a couple of other videos that you might be interested in. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrels Blades, and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you'll find examples of my work along with instructional videos showing all aspects of Japanese sword making, including forging and polishing, how to make hamones, and how to make fittings, scabbards, and handles for Japanese swords.